Do people like me? Do I measure up? Am, am I enough? Am I seen? Does anyone really care? Does anyone even really see me? Those are deep questions that we struggle with. You know, uh, some of you may say, well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care what people think. And, and well, you're lying. You, you do just like anybody else. We all put a persona up. Some may put that persona up of a gruff, tough person, and others may put up, I don't care about anything, and we're all trying to find a place to be seen, to be heard, to be known. You know, it really begins on the playground as kids. Now, some of you are chuckling right away because you know, we're like, oh, yeah. It, it's the kickball, the dreaded picking of the teams. Now, some of you see a ball and you're like, ooh, oh, the kickball. I, I want to play. Let's get a team picked. And well, yeah, you were probably the guy that had the mustache and the driver's license in middle school. And, and you're naturally athletic and it's all easy for you. And you got picked. You know, some of you are going, well, Barry, you probably were that. I'm like, no, I was the chubby little boy that didn't run fast enough, so I wasn't picked at the top of the order either. And, hmm. you know, the idea of being chosen is a big deal. And it's amazing some of the hurt that can hit a little child, even at that young age, just of being picked last. Or not only last, it might be the double worse last where it's like, okay, you're on my team. Eh. Unwanted, unloved, and that stuff hurts, and it goes deep within us. You know, it, it, it can happen for a myriad of reasons. I mean, it can happen because of your gender. It can happen because of your race. It can happen because of your athletic ability or lack thereof. It can, it can happen because of your appearance. doesn't quite meet the social standard. It might be you have the wrong haircut. It might be that you posted the wrong thing. You said the wrong thing. Maybe you don't do as well or you don't come from as well of a family. Maybe you're from the haves or the have-nots. There are so many ways that we found to devalue people in our effort to try and find value for ourselves. I wish that I could say this was going away and that it was less today than it used to be, but unfortunately, I see it growing. And, you know, research has shown kind of part of the problem, not the only problem, the main problem is the heart of people. The heart of people is we're sinful, we're broken, we're insecure, and then we reach out and try and tear someone else down to build ourselves up. Hey, isn't that crazy? The 21st century, and we still think that we have the right to take from someone else so that we can find value. Research has shown that there's a common thread and anxiety and depression that really tends to be very common. The higher social media presence you have, the higher your risk for anxiety and depression goes. And yet people argue with that, oh no, I mean, it's great. And you know, I, I have friends and I have more connections and people know it. And, and there is good that can come out of media. Don't get me wrong. I mean, just here at the church, my goodness, hey, the amount of the potential to share the gospel because of media blown me away. I got some stats from 2022, and UCC has been able to reach 160,000, yeah, accounts this past year. We have 7,000 followers, 15,000 sermons were listened to, 5,000 people actually engaged and watched on the weekend. Then at some point from 38 states and 18 countries, this is incredible to me, from all over the place, Philippines to Germany to Poland, I down in Kenya, Zimbabwe, and then covering the United States. Is that amazing? You know why? People go, wait a second, why? In this mud puddle in the middle of the United States? What? Well, we have a very specific audience here because of our 
military and our student population, we have people all around the world who tune in and we send them out and their family is out there. They're, it's just amazing that we get to have that audience. But you bring it back to the social comparison that's going on that makes it rough in my life. Yeah, there's good there. But in my life, when I see you post, I see your highlight reel. I see the best of your marriage, the best of your family, the best of your kids. I mean, your kids never make mistakes on social media. Your spouse just adores you on social media. I mean, you have all these wonderful things going on. And I know my reality that sometimes my wife and I argue and Sometimes my kids and I, we don't get along and we fight. And, and, and I know, oh man, I know me and I know my mess. And you know, long before social media, Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> How do we manage this mess? Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, watch out. Don't do your deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you'll lose your reward from your Father in heaven. Don't, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He also said, though, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Um, those conflict, right? Not at all. See, here's the thing. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Who are you bringing glory to? Who are you really trying to get a pat on the back for? That's really the question. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life, living. It's kind of like the Bible says, you know, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So as we get on, as we post, as we interact in our relationships, whatever it might be, if we're constantly looking for approval, pat me on the back. Please give me meaning. Help me to know that I'm loved. Please let me. You're fishing in a place that's going to disappoint you. There's only one place you can go for that. And that's where it's very clear we're to, we're to lift up one in our lives if we're a follower of God, and that's in Jesus Christ. Now, we're starting this series on relationships, and you might think this is a strange way to begin a series on relationships. The idea is that if we don't start in the right place, everything else is a mess. If you don't have a foundation, your home will fall apart. And so here's the thing, if, if you want a healthy relationship with your spouse, if you want a relationship in dating, if you want kids someday, if you want a home that's going to work, then we got to do some homework and it has to begin by looking inside yourself first. You know, that's not always so easy to do. And so let me challenge you with an incredible story it's in Genesis chapter 29 about a girl named Leah. In all my years of preaching, I don't think I've ever preached about this gal, but there's a lot that we can take from this and place in our own heart and learn from. Before we do, I'd like to just say a word of prayer. Would you please just join me for a moment? Oh, God, we live in such a messy world, and we're, we're not sure what to do, how to act, how to interact, and and God, honestly, we're all a little more insecure than we want to admit. And God, there's a, a lot of rotten stuff that happens in this world. And sometimes we're part of it on the receiving or the giving. And Lord, I know you have a better way for us. And so as we open your word, I ask that you would speak to us. I ask that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, and that you'd help us to dig down into the depths of our own heart and make sure we're on the right foundation. Oh, Lord, may we hear from you more than we hear from those around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, hey, Genesis chapter 29, verse 16. 
It says, now Laban, he had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah, and the younger one was named Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. (laughs) You get what they're saying. It's the politically correct, nice way of saying she wasn't very attractive. He's not saying she had cataracts or had a problem with her eyes. He's saying she wasn't very attractive. In comparison, she had to live with her younger sister, who was beautiful and had a lovely face. So poor girl, here's her time to shine in the Bible, and we get known for she's the unattractive one with the very attractive younger sister. So Leah ends up being a poster child for a struggle that you and, well, all of us tend to really struggle with. And I tell you, as a dad who's married to a beautiful woman and three lovely daughters we've got to raise, I've seen how this pours out in especially the female side of life. And But it hits men, it hits women, it hits all of us. You know, here's the thing. Ladies, I know that you might have the desire to feel more like Rachel, but you probably feel like Leah. You, you kind of are like, oh, man, when Ed Sharon sings, Man, he he sings out, you look so perfect. I I wish he was singing about me. Somebody would sing that way. But not many actually feel beautiful. Can, Can I even let you in on a secret? The ones that you look at online and you go, oh, they they have it all. They just no. Do you I don't think Rachel felt like Rachel. And even if we cover up the feelings that we struggle and try and portray this confident exterior, usually it's just showing an internal struggle that we fight. Because society has overemphasized the external so much that we've glorified the external at the expense of almost every person now. You know, Leah's story actually gets pretty painful. And you see her striving for value, striving for firm affirmation and for love. And enters in who ends up being her husband, Jacob. But the problem is Jacob loves Rachel. Jacob, just my quick reading evaluation at first, he's kind of shallow. But this should pick up in verse 18. It says, Jacob was in love with the younger sister, Rachel. He goes to her dad and says, I'll work for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. I'm so thankful when I went to my future father-in-law, I didn't have to work seven years at the newspaper he was at. He's just, Laban's like, good, let's shake on it. I I don't really have anybody better else to send her off to. Some, Some dad, he's just getting a business deal. Stay and work with me. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. Barf, that was like a Hallmark Christmas movie. Uh, I'm just like, uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I mean, I am so thankful we're going to celebrate of marriage. You know how long 30 years of marriage feels like? It's... (laughs) Well, thank you for the applause, but you know how long 30 years feels like of marriage? 30 years. (laughs) And for Marcy, maybe 40. But here's the thing. Seven years later, it gets really weird. Leah, now, poor girl, she gets worked into a scheme of dad, and dad, Laban, actually does a switcheroo on Jacob on the wedding night. And so I'm just going to give you the PG version. Uh, Jacob ends up being with Leah instead of Rachel, and he wakes up the next day, and he must have been sauced the night before. Something was going wrong here because he's like with the wrong person and then wakes up, and this is kind of what happens. The Bible continues. Jacob woke up. It was Leah. And he starts raging at Laban. What have you done for me? I've done to me. Seven years I worked for Rachel. Why have you? Poor. Can you imagine poor Leah? It wasn't her fault. She got stuck into the scheme. Dad sends her in instead. She sleeps with the guy. She wakes up going, oh, I pleased him last night, I think. And then he's raging and angry at her. And Laban, oh, Well, it's not our custom here to marry off the younger. No, 
no sorry, no I lied to you, no acceptance of that. Well, it's just our custom. We marry the younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. But wait, until the bridal week is over, then I'll give you Rachel too. Now, first of all, I, I know that's just pretty wrong sounding, but this is a time in culture when polygamy was still happening, and it was sad. The value of a woman was very low at this point. But you see the real heart of dad come out next. Hey, I'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. Business deal. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. After all, it's just a few days. And and, uh, a a week after Jacob had married Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. Oh, I, uh, I can't fathom messing with my daughter's hearts like this, first of all. Uh, I'm just like, Laban, that was so messed up. And this poor girl who's not wanted, she's recorded in the Bible as unlovely and unloved now. Sister is living in the house who was the one chosen before her, and Jacob really has the hots for her and not for Leah. Even God ends up looking in and going, oh, man, I feel bad for this girl. Very important first four words of the next verse. Verse 31 says, when the Lord saw. That just jumped out to me this week as I was, when the Lord saw. I'm so thankful that we have a God who looks down into this messy world and he sees your hurt and he sees mine and he sees your pain. He sees what you're going through. He steps in and he cares more than we ever realize. As the midst of, of so many who cause pain and so many who hurt and so many who attack. Oh, the Lord saw. He saw that Leah was unloved. He enabled her to have children, but Rachel could not conceive. Now, now some of you might not realize the cultural significance of this. This is massive. See, at this point in history, a a woman didn't have education. She didn't have value. She didn't have a say. She couldn't hardly even speak in public. There were all kinds of things. She was seen as property often. But the one thing she could bring to the table was childbearing. So we have Rachel on one hand, all beautiful and lovely, nice figure, good face, all that stuff. And then the unsparkly eyed one, poor thing. But she can have a child. So she's pregnant. She gives birth to a son. She names him Reuben. And for she says, the Lord has noticed my misery. And now, oh, and now my husband will love me. No woman, no man ought to, ought to have to pray for and beg for and hope for their spouse to love them. She ends up going through this three times. She has another son. She says, oh, the Lord, oh, I thank you, praise you, and now my husband will love me. And no. And then, oh, oh, here's my next son. And, and oh, the praise the God of heavens, but now, no, now will the, my husband love me? And no, it doesn't happen again. She's waiting for her love using the only thing that she has as a tool for her to use to try and gain the love of a man who loves someone else. Let me just say, people are dumb. They're fickle. And I know some of you are going, wait, wait, Barry, um, Pastor, you you just did a whole series and you talked about our identity in Christ, and and you said that we're a masterpiece, and now you're saying I'm dumb and fickle. Which one is it? Yes. (laughs) You know, the Bible's very clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't come out of the womb and just say, hi, mom, hi, dad, I'm here, and I'm going to be the best. No, no, we come out screaming, kicking, and we stay screaming and kicking, and we fight God, and we fight people, and we try. We're sinful at nature. There's good some in us, but there's bad in all of us. And it's when you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, when you found purpose and the gift and the grace of the cross, when God adopts you as his own and he begins to mold you as the potter does the clay. Yeah, some amazing thing happened. And you are at that point a masterpiece in the hands of the master. 
But when it comes to the heart of people, if you try and find your worth and your value and your approval in people, no matter who it is, you're setting them up for failure because they're not able to give what you want. You know, I want to jump to an interaction that Jesus had in the New Testament with people. It's found in John chapter 2. Just going to run there real quick here. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. <laughs> See, he also knew that as you fast forward in the account of his time here on earth, that the exact same people who would shout out, Hosanna, King of Kings, glory in the highest, would just a few days later shout, crucify him, crucify him. And they did that for the Son of God. And they'll do that in our life as well. And unfortunately, at times, you do that. See, God sees Leah. He sees her hurt, her pain, that she's unloved, and God loved her. That's where you find love. See, he's the groom. The real groom, you know, in Ephesians, the Bible says that he is the groom. We are the bride as the church, his people, his family, his followers, that he is the groom that lays his life down for us. See, he's a father to the fatherless, a husband to the husbandless. He is that good as a God. The Bible gives a summary of his love and pursuit of all of us, saying, you know, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I have drawn you to myself. That's how good our father is. Hey, beyond that sea, it says, see how very much our father loves you, for he calls us to be his own children into a family, that's where you find worth. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Do you catch that? Yeah, you're messy. Yes, you're broken. Yes, you have pain. But while you're a sinner, Christ died for you because he loves you that much. The most known verse in, in the Bible for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. See, there's one place you can find love, acceptance, peace, and joy, meaning, hope, and that's found in God alone. Wherever you are, in, in Poland, in, in Thailand, if you're tuning in from Zimbabwe, if you're across the United States, Wherever that might be, please hear me, God loves you. Whether you're male or female, whether you're black, brown, or white, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're athletic or not so athletic, whether you have a high IQ or a low IQ, whether you have degrees on the wall or no degrees, whether you're someone who works hard for a living or someone who thinks hard for a living, it doesn't matter. God loves you. And he wants so much more than what this world can offer. And he's offering it to us. And yet, if not careful, we're grabbing here, we're grabbing there, we're grabbing over here, we're grabbing back here. When he stands before us with arms open wide, saying, oh, my child, I'm the one you're looking for. And oh, we might acknowledge him on a Sunday. We might acknowledge him on a special day. We might, but deep down, we want more. Leah finally gets it in verse 35. It says, once again, Leah becomes pregnant. She gives birth to another son. She named him Judah. Side quick note. You remember the line of Judah? Judah. You know what comes out of the line of Judah? The line of Judah. God delivers his son to the world through her lineage. And then she says, now I will praise the Lord. I love that. Hey, this beautiful picture of, uh, of a little bit of, I think, I, I sense a little defiance there. She's like, the world may think I don't have sparkly eyes, whatever that is, and, and my husband may not love me. My kids can't define me, but one thing I will do, 
I'm going to praise the Lord because he sees me. Isn't that good? That's what we need. That's the heart of our God. And so, you know, let me just share a quick quote with you. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, years ago wrote this. Most people, if they had really learned to look in their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. You know, you're going to have relationships, you're going to have social media, you're going to have schools, you're going to have jobs, you're going to have all kinds of things that are going to offer you something they can't quite deliver. (laughs) They're not bad in and of themselves, it's just we put them in a place to find hope and peace and meaning and They're not designed for that. C.S. Lewis continues saying, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. (laughs) You're not going to find peace or happiness or joy or purpose or meaning in anything other than God himself. Are relationships important? Absolutely. We're going to talk about where to to look and where not to look next week. We're going to use a great bad example in Samson. We're going to talk about about that dating idea. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about parenting. We're going to talk about legacy and what the relationships are. All that's important. But none of it will matter if you don't deal with the vertical side of life where your identity is coming from here And then his goodness, his purpose, his love, his grace, his his all can overflow out of you and to others around you. But they can't give you what only he can give you. So my hope is that no matter how much you have struggled with this, whether you come in broken today, whether you're fairly secure that whatever happens this week, no matter where that pain comes from or joy comes from in your life, that you'd turn as Leah did and just say, okay, now I'm just going to praise the Lord. People may not like me. People may not care. People may say horrible things. I'm going to praise the Lord. See, their opinion really doesn't matter at the end of the day. There's only one, the audience of one that really matters. Live for the audience of one. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you for being our God, our Father, the husband to the husbandless, the father to the fatherless. You give hope. You give grace when we don't deserve it. You give meaning when we're lacking this meaning. You give us a purpose for the future, to something to live for beyond just making a buck. And I'm so thankful. God, I ask in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, that you would do a work in the hearts of each person listening. That you would help us to just choose to praise you no matter what happens from this world. It's in the name above all names we praise you. And I pray that there's some hearts that are just turning to you right now that they would find more than a Sunday, God, but they'd find a life, a Lord, a Savior to walk through this world with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.